All right, welcome, welcome to our lunch event today um, on trade policy. Trade policy um, has become again a very, very interesting uh, topic. Um, there's lots of discussions um, uh, about, you know, what is the right, uh, right approach to trade policy, but also what are the implications of open trade for for our society, and. Um, Today we have the privilege of um, hosting um, Minister Brian Mikkelsen, the Danish Minister for Business, Industry and Financial Affairs, as well as Maria Senius, Head of Cabinet to Cecilia Malmström, um, the European Commissioner for Trade um, here at, at Bruegel. And uh, we will start with um, both of them giving, uh, giving a, keynote, uh, a keynote speech. And then at one o'clock, um, my colleague Andre Zapir, uh, senior fellow here at Bruegel, will uh, take over and uh, chair a panel discussion. Uh, while some of us may actually will actually leave the room um, because we actually have simultaneously our own scientific advisory council meeting here next door. And so, sort of, some of our fellows and so and myself, we will sneak out and and listen and and continue a different discussion in the, with the scientific council. But Andre will chair the panel debate. So, without much further ado, let me thank you, Minister, for coming uh, today and talking about how to make trade work for all, the Danish case. Thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to your intervention. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. I, I, because then I will just... Hello. I'm not I'm a very bad singer, so you have can have this. <laughs> thank you for... Oh, live stream. Oh, sorry. I will behave like Madonna, like a virgin. No. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak at Bruegel today. Because for me as a conservative capitalist, uh, trade is one of the most powerful inventions of men. It has allowed individuals, companies, and countries to specialize in those goods and services they do best. Looking overall globally, this has increased prosperity and consumer choice. And in Europe, often in a way that is combined with high level of public service and relatively low levels of inequality. I believe it's part of our European DNA as traders, as believers in globalization and free trade, also looking back in history. Speaking to you today at a very well-respected think tank and an audience of uh, focusing on economics, I expect these statements to be neither surprising nor controversial. But if we look on the international debate on trade, I see worrying signs that the benefits of international trade are increasingly being put into question. We saw this in the context of the UK Brexit referendum on the 23rd of June, almost two years ago. I was actually, for the first time as an adult, not related to my family crying, because this was uh, an attack, I believed on, on the belief on globalization and free trade and, and, and the common values. So that was a disaster. We see this in the current US approach to international trade. Of course, there's a lot of discussions about that. I was just uh, in the US also discussing this with, with the trade minister, uh, Bill Ross, a billionaire, 80 years old, who is a businessman, um, and we had some very good discussions about that. And we see this in the rise of, of unfortunately, many populist movements in many countries, including my own. C currently, we are facing significant risk. The tit-for-tat applications of defenses, trade instruments, will harm especially small and medium-sized companies. And if you look at the structure, in my own country and in Europe, um, we consist, for example, in Denmark, of 
2.4% of our companies are SMEs. Two thirds of our private employed people are employed in SMEs. So that will be bad for both jobs and growth uh, if there will be a check on, on free trade. Today there is more than ever a need to take a stand in favor of rule-based international trade. And at the same time, it's also important to address the concerns that many people have regarding employment and equality. A number of studies looking into consequences of trade have been made in recent years. To me, one of the most important lessons is that the economic efforts of trade is dependent on political decisions. We have a responsibility as political leaders to ensure that when we talk about free trade, it also benefits ordinary people. We have the power to influence how competitive our economies are in Europe and how the benefits of trade are distributed. What the right policy is, is of course up to each country. But I believe there's a lot to learn by looking in at what works in other countries. That is why I would like to share some insights from Denmark. The insights are based on a study by Copenhagen Economics. This study is available in English on my own ministry's webpage. And we also have uh, Eva Rytter Sunusen from Copenhagen Economics as a panelist with us today who will elaborate. The main finding of the study is that expansion of trade that has taken place since 1992. It went hand in hand with economic growth, increased employment and growing wages. The Danish economy grew 46% between 1992 and 2016. More than one third of the growth was because of international trade. This translates to 12,000 euros for every Danish household, 12,000 euros, or more than the total cost of the Danish public health system, public school system, and daycare system combined. Or to put it bluntly, without trade, we could not afford our current level of welfare and social services in Denmark, and our citizens would have less money to spend. And Regarding inequality, Denmark remains one of the most equal countries in the EU. This cl clearly disproves the common claim that increased trade automatically leads to high levels of inequality. This has not been the case in Denmark. However, the overall positive picture should not be taken as evidence that the increased international trade did not have an impact on Danish workers and companies. A part of the economic benefits of trade lie in the reallocation of resources from less competitive to more competitive parts of the economy. For the economy as a whole, this development is positive. But for the people who lose their jobs, it, cannot be, it can be quite negative, both economically and personally. But looking at the all picture, we have never in... in in any situation in Danish history have as many people employed as we have now, right now. And just to illustrate, last month I was visiting one of our biggest uh, uh, farming um, estates in Denmark. And we talked about the developments from coming from the farming state in Denmark to the industry state and now to the new level of, in of technology and disruption. 60 years ago on that very big farm estate, there were uh, 2,600 people employed there. Today, they produce 10 times as much uh, on the same uh, area. 2,600 people 60 years ago, 10 times as productive today. Do you know how many people who take care of that estate? What would you guess? Five people. And that's the transition we have gone through in Europe and everywhere in the world, and is still on, on looking at the bottom line, never has as many people as right now been employed in Danish companies. So we have succeeded in that in, in Europe and also in most countries. Um, 
So even though, of course, when you have that transformation, it could affect some people personally, but for the society as a whole, it's a plus, 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 win-win game. So this is not an argument for restricting trade, but it underscores the need to have effective labor market policies, policies that can help retain people so they can find a new job. It also underscores the need for growth-oriented policies that can create the conditions for new and better jobs in other companies. And it underscores the importance of a social safety net that can co uh, cohesion the blow from losing a job. The Danish case shows that it's possible to reap the economic benefits of international trade in a way that contributes to the economic well-being of the many and not just the few. I believe that many of the results from, from, from my country, Denmark, are similar to what other European countries have experienced. If we want to continue to prosper as a region, the EU must take responsibility for the development of international trade, while we at the member states level must take responsibility for securing inclusive growth to the benefits of our citizens. I think that uh, Commissioner Maelstrom uh, is doing a great job, and I have just been recently to Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, and Mexico, and in all these growing economies, they all expect and hope that Europe will be the front runner for international trade, free trade, and globalization. They rely on that. So in our last month, we were visiting my colleague in Mexico, Ilonchi, is his name, he has a very close collaboration with Melstrom. Uh, he was almost praying that uh, that agreement with Mexico and, and Europe could help the way when they negotiate with the states. So we have responsibility as being out there arguing and fighting for free trade. And I believe that we must all realize that the biggest threat to you to European economic well-being is trading less, not trading more. Thank you. Hello there. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, not least because I very much welcome this Danish uh, case study. Uh, such evidence-based findings about the benefits of free trade, together with ideas for solutions for, to possible drawbacks, are both welcome and useful and very much needed. I know that it is more than 200 years ago now that since Ricardo developed this theory of about comparative advantage. And since then, we have also gathered so much empirical evidence showing that trade is really win-win. And that's why people have always traded. And yet, I encounter a lot of suspicion here. Maybe there is something counterintuitive about the fact that both sides win. Uh, it may be too good to be true somehow. And the traditional leader of the free world uh, suddenly does not see the value of an open values-based international order and insists that trade is unfair if it produces a trade deficit in goods in the United States. Um, so it's a strange world we live in uh, and I think that this case study is very timely indeed. Um, and the results and the conclusions drawn here really deserves to be uh, shared with a wide audience. So let me comment on a few of my favorite findings. And the first one is that the smaller EU countries are especially dependent on trade. And for me, this shows how smart it is to make trade policy an EU competence. Because it is difficult for smaller countries uh, to successfully negotiate with big partners. Uh, and for the EU as a bloc, we are together, we are the biggest trader in the world and also the biggest investor and by the way, also the biggest recipient of foreign direct investments from third countries. And this, of course, gives us a unique opportunity uh, to develop an ambitious trading agenda that underpins our prosperity, that um, promotes our uh, core European values, and also upholds European standards, be it for consumers or labor or environment. Um, 
So I think we should hurry up and set as much standards as we can, because our relative weight in the world is bound to shrink over the next decades. A second finding is the importance of uniform and transparent rules for especially small companies uh, relative to big firms. Uh, I'm very happy that the Commission has increasingly been focusing on making trade agreements work for SMEs. Uh, notably by making it quick and easy to understand what rules and regulations that apply for, for trading a certain good or service, uh, by developing uh, easy-to-use websites and, and help desks. <clears throat> and we also pay increased attention to proper enforcement of free trade agreements. Uh, you may have noticed that we make now annual FTA implementation reports and Communic communicate more than ever uh, about the substantial benefits um, to individual companies, large and small, um, but also try to carry on a, a wider debate. Um, but there is potential for more here. I think we are ready to work even harder to make outreach to the local level and to businesses and, and uh, other groups. Um, but since we have a minister here, I also very much welcome active engagement of national governments. Uh, we would really welcome if national um, governments, member states stepped up efforts to do more outreach and also abroad um, if member states through their embassies in cooperation with EU delegations um, could maybe also do more to make sure that enforcement really works and that, every, uh, that we really get the benefits from the FTAs that we, that we expect. I think a third interesting finding in this uh, case study is that the value of Denmark's trade in intermediate goods now far exceeds the value of trade in final goods, because this shows the important importance of imports. In a world marked by global value chains, uh, it is really paramount to have friction-free trade in both directions and not just focus on, on export in some old-fashioned mercantilist fashion. Fourthly, uh, the report does not deny that some workers, and especially those uh, concerned by uh, industry offshoring, experience a downward pressure on wages and sometimes a high adjustment cost on the labour market. And here I would like to recall that the Commission produced a report last year called Harnessing Globalisation, where we also discuss concerns around globalisation, like is globalisation taking jobs away? Are governments in control? Are we being left behind? And we have a very clear message in that report. Protectionism doesn't protect. Globalization is basically good, but we need to shape it. <clears throat> Open trade allows us to specialize in what we do best. It increases competition and it hastens structural change. And of course, this can be scary. Some jobs disappear and it may be less clear where the new ones will turn up. The biggest reasons for jobs being lost is technological change. Um, but of course, for the person who is made redundant, it doesn't really matter if he or she loses the job because of some new trade agreement or because of technological change. And actually, the policy implications are also the same. Um, for member states, it is very much about investing in people, making people less scared of change. It's education, training, retraining, uh, lifelong learning. In other words, the flex security that Denmark is very well known for. And Denmark also answers the inequality concern um, that trade makes us richer, but it does not necessarily guarantee that the riches will be evenly distributed. So yeah, there is no guarantee, but Denmark shows that it is perfectly possible to be very open to trade and at the same time have a low inequality in disposable income. So the way the state designs its taxes and, and welfare benefits are, are key here. Yes. At EU level, we have something called the Global Adjustment Fund, and I think we will now simplify uh, the rules, make it a bit easier to use, but this is, of course, total peanuts compared to what member states can do. It, it's really more symbolic. So I think at EU level, what the most important things we can do um, is really to help build a well-functioning, modern, competitive economy. And then I'm thinking about things like widening and deepening the single market, including a digital single market, an energy union, and also to help create a level playing field, um, tackle unfair and discriminatory practices um, by reining in um, uh, how state aid is used, and also in our 
in, in the field, uh, field of trade policy, um, we have modernized our trade defense instruments. Uh, for example, we now have changed a bit how, how dumping is calculated so as to better be able to take account of subsidies in third countries and the way state-owned enterprises uh, interfere. Uh, but not least, what we can do um, to increase the openness of our economy through an ambitious trade negotiating agenda. And I don't know if we have ever had such an ambitious agenda, uh, notably bilaterally, but also plurilaterally, and let me say multilaterally, because at heart we really are multilateralists and would like the WTO to be the place where we, where we set common rules that apply to practically everybody. It doesn't work exactly the way it should today. But anyway, in order for our ambitious agenda to re deliver real benefits, um, the EU has to be a credible negotiating partner. And this means that we have an institutional setup that allows us to ratify and implement the trade agreements that we have agreed uh, in an effective manner. And at the same time, we have to be accountable and legitimate. Um, and this should be the case irrespective of whether a final decision uh, for adoption uh, of a trade agreement takes place at EU level and or also at member state level, i.e. regardless of whether an agreement is, is mixed uh, or not. Uh, it makes good sense for member states to, to be involved and to involve their national parliaments early on, regardless. Um, I think ever since Commissioner Malmström took, uh, took office, uh, we have managed to increase transparency significantly. Um, try to demystify what we are doing when we negotiate trade agreements. Uh, for example, by publishing or negotiating texts. And you may have noticed also last autumn when we took the step for the first time to publish the Commission draft mandates for new negotiations. Uh, at the time it was for Australia and New Zealand and also the negotiating mandate for the Multilateral Investment Court. That meant that we sent these texts at the same time to the European Parliament and to uh, the Council and national parliaments. We have also set up an, a dedicated group of experts to give advice on various aspects of, of trade policy, in addition to all the other ways we have to consult um, uh, and carry out civil, civil dialogues, etc. Uh, and with this approach, I think that we do manage to keep a strong negotiating position and at the same time keep, at the same time keep an open discussion going inside the EU uh, about our current and future trade policy. But maybe to sum up a little bit, how to make trade work for everyone? Well, open global trade is really key for a competitive and prosperous European Union. We must not forget what made us rich in the past. <laughs> More than 30 million jobs uh, are now supported by European exports to the rest of the world. But in a world marked by global value chains, we also depend very much on friction-free imports. A globally integrated economy benefits European companies, citizens, consumers, workers. So we really, really have to stand up for an open international rules-based system. Um, this report, the Danish uh, case study, recalls that global trade increased twice as much as global GDP from 1992 until the economic crisis. Uh, that meant help, the trade really helped push growth um, in the world. And this is no longer the case. So I would like to end exactly the way the minister ended, uh, and I had planned this beforehand. I am not worried about too little trade. Uh, sorry, too much trade. I worry about too little trade. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. And I hand over the mic to André to chair the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm assuming that we can have uh, about 10, uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions and an answer from uh, from the floor. Is that uh, is that all right? Uh, before we go to the uh, to the panel discussion. So uh, I think we heard a very uh, upbeat uh, presentations uh, by uh, by both of you. Uh, I mean, let me say that I, I share I share what uh, what you said. Um, but uh, maybe not everybody in Europe uh, would share uh, what you said. And uh, I mean, I'm trying to you know, see uh, you are, uh, I think uh, you have a view 
uh, which is definitely, I think, the uh, the positive sum game, as you both uh, uh, as you both said, and this is the view that uh, that economists have indeed, you know, since uh, since Ricardo. Uh, but as I think you both uh, you both indicated, um, maybe now not so much in Europe, uh, in other parts of the world uh, across the Atlantic, uh, there is less enthusiasm for this view, which was held very dearly in, in the United States, and maybe in some part of Europe, sometime in one country, sometime in the other, uh, there is uh, less an, uh, enthusiasm. And uh, I think, okay, the, the, Danish, uh, the Danish case, since this is the, uh, the primary material uh, for, this, uh, for this discussion, is, as you, Minister, very much emphasized, uh, Denmark as a very well-working uh, social uh, social model you know we all know all about the flexi security and uh, I think this is also in a sense what Europe has in principle uh, agreed to to work towards but it works better in some countries than in others and um, so I think in the countries where it works less well then there's more fear obviously, that the displacement, because part of the gains from trade, they also come from displacement, right? From the fact that we, uh, we contract activity in some, in some domains and we expand in, in others. But if indeed there are difficulties of, you know, moving jobs, uh, then those who are attached in job, you know, it's very well to say, you know, there are other opportunities, but if people do not see that, then they want to remain to their job, even may, maybe at the detriment of social welfare, they are obviously attached to their own uh, to their own situation. So I think that that is, in a sense, it's it's almost a trivial question, but I think not an obvious question at all. Is uh, in the smaller open economies, and that's you know we, we talked about smaller open economies of which Denmark is one. We do see that in general in Europe but also compared to the United States, those social models work better. In a sense, globalization is nothing new for small countries, right? They've always been globalized. It was called something different, but they were always globalized. They always had to respond, to adjust to, uh, to changes, and they did very well, and therefore they constructed social models that, that do that. For some larger countries, even in Europe, you know, for some medium scale, but larger countries are for the United States, they were maybe in the past relatively more insulated, and therefore they did not build those uh, social uh, labor market institutions able to deal with these big you know, changes that are taking place, you know, whether it's technology or globalization. So in a sense, what would be your advice? You know, uh, it's all very well you know, to say to the other, trade is great and there's lots of benefits, but beyond that, what would be your advice when you are meeting colleagues from countries in Europe uh, where, you know, on the part of citizens, maybe there is more skepticism when you say, well, you know, you need to fix your social models. But, you know, what, what would, we cannot all become Danish. Would be good if we could, but maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not tomorrow, right? So, you know, what, what, is, your, what is your advice in a sense, in a political sense? How do we deal with it? We know what should be done. How could it be done? What do you think? Of course, all of you are welcome to be citizens in Denmark. I mean, being EU citizens is very easy. Coming to Denmark, no. Um, what, what, uh, what, how could we convince uh, everybody to, to go on the trade agenda? I think it's interesting to see countries that have succeeded with this model, uh, Germany, Sweden, Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg and so on, that they are almost equivalent to Denmark, of course, different sizes, but it ha we have succeeded in, in being trading na nations, um, low inequality, and that combination works in, in the countries I just mentioned. But we, even in, in these countries where we have low inequality, we have huge populist movements. Looking at Germany, my own country, Sweden, Netherlands. Um, we have um, Austria, uh, very big uh, populist movements. 
So that shows me there's a challenge everywhere, because if we cannot even convince our own population about the advantages of globalization and free trade, uh, then it must be more difficult in other countries where they have not have that success as we have had in, in the countries I just mentioned. What what will be the best uh, we can do in Denmark? We are we have um, established what we call a disruption council with participants from the trade unions, the employers organizations and, and the government and the political system because we can see when we go out and talk to ordinary people they are worried about the future, even in, in my small country. Uh, and when I talk to ordinary people they worry about new technology, they worry about uh, free trade, would, would we lose our jobs, would it move to other countries? And, and the best case we, we are trying to do in Denmark is to have a cooperation between all parts of society to show that it's beneficial for every day if we do more free trade and we do more globalization. And what was one of the reasons probably why the, the laws, unfortunately, the referendum in the UK was, I don't think it was just because of all the East Europeans and Poles that go on in London, it was also the, the, the dream and thinking that they would regain some of the facts, some of the factory jobs they lost in the car industry and, and other productions. And um, they, they lost the discussion about globalization and free trade. So we have decided in Denmark that we will win that discussion. So everybody in Denmark are aligned. So everybody could see that so it's productive and constructive in a, in a constructive dialogue. Everybody would benefit from free trade. And looking at our numbers right now, that's interesting. In Denmark, there's a growing tendency to be more pro-European, more pro-free trade, more pro-globalization. And we just, uh, just saw some surveys last week saying it's growing like this. And that's going the right way right now because we're trying in an alliance with everybody to convince the people of Denmark that it's the right way to go. Uh, thank you. I, I find it interesting, oh, uh, interesting to note that member states have all become you know, more Danish uh, since Trump uh, moved into the White House. He has had a unifying effect uh, and practically all member states saying that we need more trade and if, if the US is turning its back to the world, we should step up and, and take more space. Um, and the South that I think you know, traditionally may have been more skeptical towards trade have been, have been among the most enthusiastic. Talk to, to, to uh, Spain, Portugal and also Italy, I don't know what will happen in the future, but they have been among the most adamant uh, you know, saying we need more, more trade agreements, go, go. Uh, I think that's, a, that's rather interesting. Then, of course, there are different emphases, and uh, some countries uh, you know, highlight a lot the issues that are sensitive for them, and we, of course, have to listen very carefully so that we take on board what are offensive interests for, uh, for our member states and companies and, and be careful with the defensive ones. Um, but I think that's interesting to note. Uh, and maybe just a little note on Brexit. Uh, some of those who voted Brexit were extreme globalizationists, and so, you know, global Britain, uh, the old empire should come back, and they were extremely open. So, so yeah, they were both uh, contradictory uh, um, um, votes there. Uh, but then on the more, on the, on this, it's more social policy and, and sensitivities. I mean, what, what we are doing a little bit more, I think, in, in Europe is to talk about social policies, but again, the big money is, of course, in the member states. So what we can do is basically uh, exchange, best, pra exchange best, best practices and, and uh, cooperation style. Um, I don't want to raise expectations too much because I don't think we should talk about things that we really cannot deliver at European level. Before, I mean, before opening the floor for, for some questions, to take two, three questions, um, I mean, one, one um, I mean, I, I, I agree with you that uh, obviously the, the resources, especially the financial resources about um, social policy are almost entirely at the, uh, at the national level. But there is what you, you, you mentioned at the European level, the, the globalization fund. And it's 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 small amount of money, and um, I mean we have uh, we have been uh, looking into into this, studying it, and um, I personally think it's it's a good idea. Uh, I mean, 
network function better and you know it's it's new so one has to draw we are re exactly so it's being reformed and you know it's recent so you know one is learning from experience but um i think it's it's a useful it's useful also politically uh, useful but perhaps one element uh, is that perhaps it could be used a bit more in sort of incentivizing countries in sort of their own reform uh, so it's not just money but as, as you're talking uh, and, and and i agree with you sort of you know sharing experience uh, maybe the globalization fund also can be a forum since there are uh, in each country there are those agencies that are dealing with with that maybe there it's you know it's a tool it's an entry point maybe for uh, for the uh, for the sharing of experience and for uh, a European way to you know to move uh, to move forward, but uh, let me uh, let me open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, I think we can take about three four three four questions. Yes, one question at, at the at the very back first. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, is, I would like to get back to concrete policy to make sure that the the cake is shared. Um, through whole, throughout the, the society. Um, Maybe you can say who you are. Oh, excuse me, I'm Naim Cordemans. I work for the Central Bank of Belgium. Um, yeah, there is a trade globalization and, and uh, international trade is increasing inequality in, in two ways, in, in my sense. Um, it reinforces the winner take all economy, and technology is even reinforcing that nowadays and at the same time it makes more complicated to uh, to follow redistributive policy because uh, capital is also uh, much more uh, uh, flexible uh, and can can be moved from one country to the other much more easily so at the same time you have a globalization creating more inequality and making more difficult to reduce inequality so how, how do you reconcile this and concretely as Denmark um, adapted uh, its social model um, in the context of globalization. Since 1992, have you been able, have you adopted new policy? Because you, you already had a, a social model, which was uh, okay. very... Uh, okay, good. there's another question here. Right here. We'll take, uh, we'll take three, uh, three questions and give you the... Thank you. Uh, I'm not so positive to this idea about the European Social Fund uh, because I think we should learn there from the United States where they have a system where you, if you can prove or the trade unions can prove that they have lost jobs because of imports, then the whole public discussion being, gets directed to, yes, let's prove that we are losing from imports, that imports is a bad thing. So I think it's uh, tread very carefully there because otherwise you, you, you're creating an animal which will in the end perhaps destroy more than help. But my question to the, uh, well, you may oppose, of course. Uh, my question is also, well, we have two elephants in the room here. One is Donald Trump and has been touched upon, but the other is the Chinese. Can we trust? I mean, of course, for China now, free trade is wow. They have really, I mean, they have a, one billion people have been raised from abject poverty to a reasonable li living standards. So, of course, in China, so of course, they are in favor. But in the end, can we rely on the Chinese to be protectors of free trade and competition, etc.? Third question. Let's take those, those two and, and those, the last two questions. Okay. Um, Kurt Geiser from Backbone Consulting in Germany. Now that you mentioned uh, the, the White House, um, Commissioner Malmström is in talks with her counterparts in the United States. For these talks, and I uh, come back also to your question, should we take uh, China as a model and propose to reduce the trade surplus of the European Union in one way or the other in order to prevent a trade war. Thank you. 
And uh, thanks, uh, Hans von der Burchardt. Uh, I'm with Politico here in Brussels. Uh, my question is also very related to the previous one. Um, I know we have all a European position of the four points which we would like to offer the United States in trade talks if we get a permanent exemption from the steel and aluminium tariffs. Now, we've already heard that perhaps this might not be the case. There might be maybe some quota on 90%, etc. Um, your southern neighbor in Germany, they're very much pushing to keep trade talks even if uh, if we don't get that permanent exemption. Uh, I know there's been another call from Sigma uh, sorry, uh, Peter Altmaier to do this today. Um, it would be interesting uh, to hear Denmark's position on this issue. Thank you. So let's start from uh, Member State and then the Commission. I, I I I don't uh, actually I don't agree with the, uh, the the premises for your question about inequality, because looking at the global numbers, it's it's showing me I'm also an economist, uh, showing me that uh, that we have lifted uh, millions of people from poverty uh, to not just uh, over the level of poverty but also to the middle class. And we could mention lots of cases like that. Last two, uh, two, three weeks ago, I was in the Philippines, a country of 105 million people. They're growing to 150 million people. According to the World Bank, they will be the 15 biggest uh, economy in the world. And they are each year experienced that um, several hundred thousand people are moving from poverty to a higher level of living conditions because of free trade and globalization, because they don't isolate themselves. What have we done in Denmark? Um, we have not changed our laws, but we have had a coalition between the trade unions and also the companies. And it's, it's, I think especially I would like to, to also praise the trade unions because they have been very responsible in Denmark looking at, at what would benefic be beneficial for their members. And that would be to take full part in free trade and globalization. So we have a very good cooperation in Denmark between the political system and the trade unions and the companies. And of course, uh, mainly responsible for that is also that the trade unions are very uh, responsible. Um, our position on, 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 on what Trump is doing, I, I had, as I mentioned, a very constructive meeting with Will Barosh, and I know that Melstrong has lots of meetings and talks talks with him. And I don't understand the American position, because I have grown up with U.S. being the front runner and fighter and promoter for free trade. How has U.S. been built since 1776 by free trade? by building up relations with other countries, by trading, and also beneficial for their own country, uh, citizens. Um, in Denmark, we support uh, that we should uh, also answer uh, the restrictions from U.S. with tough restrictions. And I don't understand them. When I talk to the Americans, they always talk about China. They don't talk about Europe as a threat. Uh, so they're trying to hit China indirectly by also making some sanctions on Europe. And it's a big problem for the understandings in the American administration. I don't understand them. I love America. Uh, and um, usually we are very allied. But in this way, I don't. it would be very harmful for also the American population. And it would give them false hopes for, for regaining some industries back to the U.S. But because that will never happen in, a, in this global society. So they should make out their deals with China and continue their good trading relationship with Europe. Uh, that's my best hopes that they could sit down with China and find out what relations they have. Our point of view regarding China is that uh, there is problems with China. And we have to solve that in the WTO to GO, um, um, negotiations. And we actually in Denmark share uh, the, that the US are worried um, about the market openings and the reforms in China. Uh, and we think that they have too much state involvement. Um, but even though we agree on, on, upon that, we think that all uh, actions should be taken into the uh, uh, WTO system and not bilaterally. 
And so we uh, actually agree with the US on that, but we fully support what uh, Commissioner Malmstrom is is trying to do now to avoid um, a trade war between Europe and US. Nobody would benefit from that. Yes, thank you. To the first question, I also wanted to make the point that globalization has lifted millions of people out of poverty. Um, and yeah, but and exactly, I was going to come to that. So that, there is a difference. And within countries, of course, that's about how you how you choose to do income distribution within your country, and it's how you design your tax system and your welfare benefits. Um, yes, uh, <laughs> yes, China. Can we trust that they are are uh, now doing the right thing? No, we cannot, uh, because we have seen that. Um, President Xi is good at making uh, beautiful speeches about globalization and uh, in Davos and other places, but um, when it comes to what is happening on the ground in China, there are reasons to be concerned because things are not going in the right direction. Um, I.e., from my point of view, it's not getting more and more market-oriented. It's actually a growing role for state-owned enterprises, for example. Um, we have a lot of, lot of our companies are in China, and they may not dare to speak out themselves all the time because they are afraid of getting targeted. But it's very interesting to see what they say when the European Chamber of Commerce asks them once a year in the annual survey, because then they can you know, speak openly without being named exactly. Uh, and it actually shows that they are there are really growing concerns about discrimina discrimination of all kinds of, of uh, ways and uh, strange park procedures and uh, uh, and a growing role for state-owned enterprises and, and subsidies from the Chinese state, um, not to mention forced technology transfers uh, and other problems. So China is really a headache. And the best way of making China change is to join forces with other countries with the same interest. That is, of course, why the EU and US should stand together and face down China. China doesn't like to be isolated. So if we stand together and say, hey, now you have to you know, behave, take your responsibility. You are benefiting very much from this uh, open world order. Now you also have to take a bigger responsibility. Um, then we can actually, I'm sure, get change. But if we play stupid unilateral games, uh, I really think it's a big mistake and a lost opportunity. Um, to the question, should we agree to reduce our trade deficits, uh, play, play the US the way China does? No, we can't, because this is such a stupid criteria. Um, trade, it, it, I, think, tr I think Trump is fooled because trade deficit and trade uh, policy, it, it sounds like it has very much to do with one another, but it doesn't. Um, I'm sure that the big tax reform in the US um, will increase demand generally, including demand for imported goods. So Trump's tax reform will, re will make the trade deficit worse, and that becomes our headache then? Uh, we, we, can't, we can't really... We can't really promise to reduce their trade deficit with us. And by the way, we are not China. We are not a planned economy. Should we tell our companies, no, you shouldn't sell to the United States? I mean, how should we do this? Um, and voluntary export restrictions are actually against both EU law and WTO law. Um, so no, that doesn't work. Um, should we unilaterally, because uh, one of the things that Trump has been obsessed about is the fact that we have 10% tariffs on, on cars coming into the EU, whereas they only have 2.5% in the US. For other goods, of course, it may be the opposite. Uh, we have different peak tariffs in dif on different goods for historical reasons. But anyway, he's obsessed with cars. Could we unilaterally decide to just lower our car tariffs in Europe? Well, hypothetically, yes, we could. But because of the most favored nation rule, we would have to lower it not only vis-a-vis -vis the United States, but also vis-a-vis -vis China, Japan, uh, India. Uh, and it would actually be a, a total slap in the face of our Japanese friends because they negotiated very hard when we concluded our free trade agreement recently to get better access for their cars to Europe. And in exchange, we got better access on agriculture and other things that were important to us. Should we then have all of a sudden just give it away to everybody? Um, I think that could really jeopardize the ratification of the Japan Agreement. Um, just to give you an example of how stupid it would be. Um, I think those were the main questions. Great. I think uh, only left to me to, to thank you, to thank you both 
for uh, taking the time to have this uh, interesting discussion between yourselves and, and with the audience. And uh, good work to continue upholding free trade. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let me now call the, the panelists to, uh, to the podium here. And so we move to the second part. Thank you again. Please. So we have uh, one hour uh, for the uh, for the panel uh, for the panel discussion, and uh, we have heard already quite a bit uh, about the Copenhagen Economics Study. But now we are going to hear more. What uh, you know, what the, the study uh, the study contains, and what are some of the uh, the results uh, of the uh, of the study. So, uh, Eva, I will ask you uh, to speak first, to to give us uh, a flavor at least uh, of what the study says, and then we will go to two uh, to two commentators. Uh, we have uh, one commentator coming from. Uh, the labor unions in, uh, in uh, Denmark, and then one commentator from uh, business uh, from business Europe. So um, we'll go in that uh, in that order. So Eva, yes, uh, your presentation first. Thank you very much. I'll get up here and because I have a few uh, slides with me. Uh, so thanks for the invitation and for Brugel for organizing this. Um, so I'll uh, I'll give a few. Uh, key points from the Danish study. Uh, so uh, Copenhagen Economics has conducted uh, numerous uh, trade studies for the European Commission, but this is the first time I'm in Brussels presenting a Danish case, so that's, uh, that's great. Um, um, so as we've heard uh, many times before, there's a clear tendency for open economies to also have higher incomes per capita. Uh, Danish is, Denmark is no exception, a little bit more open uh, than, than other countries, but that's most likely due to the small size. We are more dependent on trade and we benefit more from trade. Uh, we use our market access to specialize in the goods we're, we're good at producing and, and have opportunities to import what we can't produce ourselves. Um, so um, these open economies, as we also heard before, both import and export, and uh, and they're equally important. And uh, when we double click on the Danish um, trading figures, we see that uh, while exports have increased more than imports, um, our imports of intermediate goods have increased a lot more than our imports of final goods, which just demonstrates that Danish firms in, in integrate more and more in global value chains have become increasingly important uh, to have access to cheap uh, cheap imports and. In, in Denmark, it's actually being discussed now whether, in addition to having an export strategy and an investment promotion strategy, whether we need an, an import strategy, because it's so important to Danish firms to have access to, to cheap inputs. Uh, and also, of course, important for Danish consumers to, to have the free choice of, of, of the goods and services they like to consume. So from uh, 1992 till uh, up until the financial crisis, global trade increased on average twice as uh, fast as, uh, or twice as much as, as global GDP. So we call this hyperglobalization. In, in Denmark, uh, the figure is actually free. So global trade increased by a factor three in Denmark. Uh, but as you can see here, this was the case for most of the member states uh, or, or the countries we like to compare ourselves against. So, 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 um, so Denmark, Denmark is not a special case, which is why um, some of the lessons learned from Denmark may be useful for other countries as well. So, some of the drivers of this, have, of course, been the technolog technological progress, um, but also the whole uh, trade liberalization agenda pursued by the EU and, and globally is a major. Uh, factors. So we have the single market, we have EU free trade agreements, we have the whole WTO uh, trading system established in this period, uh, we have the opening up of China, of course, but that's uh, not driven by EU policymakers, but that's also 
uh, a key driver to this uh, and to this uh, growth in, in global trade. Um, so in this study, we've looked at macroeconomic developments and labor market developments in Denmark during this period of hyperglobalization. So if you should be concerned about uh, you know, trade uh, harming um, inequality, um, jobs, you should definitely be able to see that in this period because it's it's been so intense in terms of in terms of trade. Um, so as you can see here, these are some of the key indicators from the study. Um, so maybe I should just say that uh, there are much more figures in the Danish uh, report, uh, and you can probably read the the graphs in there without understanding Danish. But there is a a summary in English uh, with some of the key findings. But as you can see here, uh, you have both international trade, employment, and real wages increasing at the same time, uh, and you see unemployment uh, dropping. Um, so, so, so in, in, put together, uh, this this draws a very positive figure of of trade supporting um, real wages and employment. Um, and keeping unemployment low. And, and, and maybe I should say in this period, um, Denmark also implemented quite a, a number of um, labor market reforms, which actually increased labor supplies. Uh, so that avoided bottlenecks in the, in the Danish labor market uh, quite significantly. So you have, uh, you have real wages going up. Part of that is actually a crisis uh, developing less, increasing less fast due to international trade than would have been the case without it. So, uh, so by importing and getting access to cheap uh, goods and services uh, from other countries, inflation has been kept low. So you should remember that workers are both workers and consumers. So when you measure their uh, real income, and um, they both benefit from, from higher wages and, and, uh, and lower prices. Right, so just summing up the key findings from the study, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to, to, uh, to give more details afterwards in the panel discussion if, if, if relevant. But, uh, but when we look uh, back uh, from 2000, uh, 1992, um, we see that 120 jobs have been uh, additional uh, supported by, uh, by exports. So altogether, exports now support uh, more than 800,000 jobs in Denmark. So that's one third of the total private um, uh, number of jobs in Denmark. So it's, 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 quite, it's quite massive taking, of course, both direct and, and indirect impacts uh, of jobs into account. Uh, we see that Danish firms are increasingly engaged in global value chains, very much depending on importing, exporting, but may also, um, in some cases, uh, uh, establish themselves abroad. So while talking about trade, we're also talking about uh, foreign direct investments and 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 uh, where to locate your production and your and your uh, and your uh, your headquarters and and all other functions uh, that that support your your company. Um, so we estimate that Danish uh, GDP increased by 240 billion since uh, 1992. And as the minister said, uh, this is this amounts to around uh, how much was that? Twelve thousand euros every year per household in Denmark. So it's quite an, an important lift uh, that this um, increase in trade during this period of hyperglobalization has has materialized into. Um, so while overall uh, unemployment has fallen, employment increasing real wages increasing. We also see a, a, a group of workers that have been under pressure by globalization, in particular cheap imports from China. Um, we see that uh, in particular workers that are laid off due to offshoring uh, are unemployed for a longer period of time and, uh, and take quite a number of years before they um, reach the level of income before they are laid off. So, so there is a, there is a group of workers that are being on, that, that are under pressure, and that's mainly the the, um, the lower ed educated uh, workers, um, and and in particular workers whose skills have become uh, abundant. Um, as mentioned, international trade has also lowered prices for consumers, 
increase the consumer choice. Um, and this is something we look at in the, in the study by comparing um, uh, the development in prices for goods that are traded a lot with goods that are not traded so much. And that's one way to do it. Uh, I'm surprised how little knowledge we have about the consumer impacts of free trade. I've, I haven't really seen any good uh, studies on this, and, and having done a lot of impact assessments for the European Commission on, on EU trade policies, I must say this, this has not really been an, an issue. It's not been uh, something that has been paid much attention to. Um, we've mainly looked at macroeconomic impacts and impacts for firms, looking a little bit on, on prices, but not on these uh, consumer impacts. And I think, I think that's, uh, I don't know whether it's Bruegel or somebody else who should you know, look into this and, and, and see. I've seen a few studies um, from, from the US that are quite, that are quite uh, solid, uh, but not for, for the EU. So, so this is kind of a, a blind spot, I think, um, that, that's worth looking into. Um, so, just to, uh, to, uh, to finish up where I think the minister ended, um, Denmark is the third most equal, or the, the, has the third lowest inequality uh, compared to other uh, European member states. Um, and, and I do think that this is one of the reasons why uh, Danes are so supportive of um, free trade. Um, um, and we've heard uh, the flex security model of Denmark being mentioned, and I don't know if you're all aware of what that means, but it just means that it's very easy to hire and fire workers in Denmark. It means that when you're unemployed, you have, uh, you have uh, quite significant uh, social benefits. But, um, but, I, uh, but this is kind of it's one leg. Another leg is, of course, the active labor market policies, I think, we're also among the countries in Europe that invest the most in active labor market policies. So uh, re-educating um, uh, workers that are being laid off and whose skills have become abundant. Um, but I think it's also important to mention, and you had the, the comment about, um, about taxes and, and capital have been, become more uh, um, movable across borders, and I agree to that. But that, that, that's also been one explanation why we have a lot of redistribution from progressive a progressive tax system. We have, uh, and that's one of the reforms that have been implemented in Denmark, uh, quite elaborated uh, pen pension schemes. And I think it's, it's also worth um, taking pensions into account when you talk about reallocating the gains from, from trade. Because uh, in Denmark, uh, workers own uh, part of some private firms that are benefiting from international trade, and they, uh, via their um, social security pension, pension schemes, some of them mandatory, others uh, uh, private, uh, actually also get uh, some of the benefits uh, that accrue to firms uh, via their pensions. So. Um, I think that was uh, the words for me. Um, yeah, happy to elaborate uh, right. afterwards. Thank you, thank you very much, Eva. Uh, that was a very, uh, very useful, uh, very useful presentation. Maybe we we can come back to some of those elements in the uh, in the uh, in the discussion. Uh, let me first uh, move to the first uh, commentators, Casper, uh, who comes from the. Uh, Danish uh, Confederation of, uh, of Trade Unions. Uh, I think you have a few slides yes, uh, yes, as well. Yes, please. Sorry, I don't slides. need to press any button. I can just... Yes. I think they would, yeah. They would yeah. yeah. know, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, so thanks a lot for having me in uh, such an interesting seminar uh, on, on trade. I adopted your title because I think it very much encapsulates uh, the prime question of trade today. Uh, namely, how do we make, make it work for all? And this is also why it's such a key element for, for, for trade unions around the Europe, but particularly for, for, for us in Denmark. Uh, I know we have a strong uh, Nordic alliance in terms of being progressive towards trade, but it, it, also, it also really is, a, is a, 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 on the European agenda. We really need to, need to discuss it a bit more, how we can make it work for, for all that is part of our societies. Um, so, so firstly, yes, as you see, trade, union, oh, trade unions uh, really, really talk a lot about uh, 
of trade agreements. And, and why do we do that? Well, because we believe that, and I should be more specific here, some of the negative consequences of, of uh, globalization, because there are mainly gains from, from globalization. But as Eva also mentions, um, there are some workers who lose their jobs. And uh, we believe that trade policy can uh, be a, an efficient tool to actually mitigate some of the negative consequences. Um, so how do we do that? I'll get back to that in a second. But first of all, workers' rights and equal competitive conditions are very much interlinked. Um, we need to compete in terms of products, uh, quality, services, not in terms of who can, can have uh, the, the cheapest uh, labor conditions. Uh, it should really be the other way around. Um, and we see some, some negative examples, but we also see there's a progression. I very much agree with that. Um, so trade agreements is a policy lever to, to actually improve labor market conditions worldwide uh, on an international scale, which can in turn uh, facilitate, um, facilitate fair competition, because as, as I said before, they're very much interlinked. Um, I wrote 700,000 because our report is a couple of years old. <laughs> so it's all good with some, some updated numbers. Um, but yeah, really it's, it's about creating a living uh, level playing field for, for all to enjoy the, the benefit, benefits of trade. Um, I only used two uh, pie charts just to, to really, uh, we, we did it also, did, did a study or we did a study uh, together with the de Denmark statistics in terms of international trade and how it really impacts uh, Danish workers' lives. And I, I choose two parts. Now. The first of all, one is, is whether international trade is a, is a threat or is perceived as a threat to your future job and is it perceived as a threat in terms of having a few others in, in the future. And as you can see, 64% believe to a small extent or not at all. So the Danish workers do not fear globalization, do not fear trade. And there's a specific reason for this. This is because there's been an investment in lifelong learning, there's been a technological investment, but there's also a social security net, as, as, as Eva mentioned, that really uh, catches those who fall uh, uh, as some of the negative consequences of, of trade. So, in short, Danish workers do not fear trade policy or trade agreements. Um, if, if we talk about the, 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 the conditions, which of course is hard, the agenda for workers, uh, pay and working conditions, with the conditions that become, uh, how, how would they be in the future? And you can see uh, a very large proportion, sorry, 58% uh, believe that it won't change at all. Uh, I think this gives a very clear cut picture of how uh, trade is perceived in Denmark. Um, actually, there's another pie, uh, chart, I didn't bring it today because I could go on all day, but it actually shows that what workers really do fear is that if there's no technological investments in the companies, because then they know they will not be able to compete because labor market is changing and workers are aware of that. That's also why a lot of the Danish workers participate in life and learning, life and learning even though there's been a drop, but really need to make sure that they still participate in life and learning in the future. Because right now, the, it's the common sense of the digitalization and stuff like that, uh, being able to be innovative, being able to transition yourself into new economies, but what will it be in 10 years, what will it be in 20 years? And we really need to adapt all the time. And that is how the Danish model also work. We have a tribal chain negotiation from last year, which really uh, addresses uh, the digitalization uh, issues in terms of workers not having the right conversations or in terms of upskilling and reskilling. Um, so it's really hard the agenda. We are doing something about it. We can always do more. But I think uh, when social partners are involved and uh, we, we see a, a strong co cooperation between state level actors and businesses and workers, we can achieve great results, which reduces the, f the threat of globalization and trade. Um, so how do we make it work? Um, a big point of the agenda for trade unions is just transition. And of course, this is something to do with, with both the climate becoming more green, but it's also to do with, uh, with catching those who fall, uh, who lose their jobs uh, due to international competition, due to globalization. Um, this is also why the Globalization Fund is an e e ex extremely important instrument. But the most important instrument at the national level is the public employment services and their uh, ability to facilitate lifelong learning, uh, to get workers to return to jobs. Because we can see those with, with the, 
the workers who are not academics, uh, who belong maybe to the middle class in some sense, uh, they are uh, not jeopardized, but they they are really impacted by globalization. But they're also willing to, to do what is necessary to, to learn uh, in a lifelong perspective and, and really grasp the opportunities of globalization. Um, one point about democracy at work, uh, I think it's, it's become a European trend. Uh, we can take all the credit, but the European Works Council, if you don't know what it is, uh, <laughs> maybe we can talk about it afterwards, but uh, European Works Council is, is a way to ensure that, uh, that workers are heard when the, the businesses uh, outsource or uh, do mergers and stuff like that to really guarantee the workers' input so you can actually uh, sort of transition together. This is also the way that businesses can know what are the skills needed by the workers so maybe they can actually follow in this uh, changing environment. And it's a way to promote decent working conditions and also productivity growth. growth. Uh, we need more studies on this. <laughs> Hopefully we can have some more studies in the future, but it's one of our arguments. Uh, lastly, I would like to just uh, I, I put a couple of hard copies out there. We did uh, also did a project, more effective pr provisions on worker rights and future trade agreements, because, uh, and I can hand some out afterwards if you're interested, uh, because we can see uh, with European trade deal that it's really uh, an important tool to raise the standards worldwide, because we need to compete uh, on, on products, on quality of products, and not labor market conditions. Um, yes, maybe we can elaborate on that. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Casper. It was also a, a very interesting, uh, very interesting presentation. I mean, very much complementing the, the the previous presentation, very much on uh, very much on Denmark. Uh, we are going to move to a more uh, pan-European um, discussion now uh, with. Uh, Sofia Burner from um, from Business Europe. M maybe just one point already before we. Uh, I'll, I'll make some comments uh, at the end. Um, I, I, I think an, in, an interesting issue it seems to me, um, and you know Sofia may address it in probably indirect manner. Is we have one trade policy, okay, and this is indeed as. Uh, as was said in the uh, in the keynote speeches, I mean this is clearly a strength uh, of of Europe. Uh, we have a common commercial policy. We have had that from the uh, from the start of the uh, of the European Union. We speak with one voice, and we are heard. Speaking with you know, we are heard. Uh, you know, we can negotiate with with countries with some uh, with some weight and with some credibility. And um, that is that is great, uh, but when we move to the um, the topic of today, which is the interrelationship between trade and say adjustment, social policy, labor market, then obviously we enter into a, an, a, a, an area where countries have very different policies, and so in a sense, uh, it's not trivial to have uh, a common trade policy with very diverse labor market and social policies, right? Because, uh, as you say very rightly, and, and, and your chart, you now Casper showed it very well, and your previous chart as well, in a country like Denmark, where labor market institutions, social institutions work very well, and again, you, you showed a lot of uh, indicators of that, then indeed the support for globalization in a sense it's almost a support for the for the, the way the system is working right i mean what is it that people are voting for when they're asked about globalization are they asked about globalization are they asked as workers how do they feel they're happy as workers right and they're happy as the whole. when you're not happy about one it may translate into unhappiness with the other and it's therefore it's not a trivial and you know i mean you can say trump okay is doing exactly the opposite of what one would need in terms of skills building, in terms of you know uh, taxation and redistribution, all of those elements. Then people are you know not so enthusiastic about globalization, and that stands to uh, to, to, to reason. But I think inside Europe, it's also non-trivial given that we have a diversity. So, uh, Sofia, it's uh, you know up to you know to to bring all of those things together to have a, a european 
uh, vision you know, from the, uh, the side of, uh, of business here. Please. Thank you very much, and indeed, it is a pleasure for me to be here. Um, it's a very interesting debate, and it's always a risk, uh, but also a privilege to be the last speaker, because you have heard all the different opinions, and um, I'm here to bring also the European perspective, the perspective of European businesses. And if I may start by, by my two main pickups from today's event, um, specifically on, on the case of, of Denmark and how we can take this example and perhaps expand it to the rest of, of Europe. Um, the first lesson is that, of course, the research shows that there is a connection between accepting trade, um, having a positive view of, of the benefits that trade brings, and the level of the social protection and security in a given country. And I think here Denmark is, is an excellent example um, in this case. And the second lesson that I take home with me is that Denmark has structures to support the downsides of globalization. Uh, they have a very long um, uh, tradition of social dialogue and partnership. We heard it, we also hear it from our Danish members uh, representing industry and employers. They are um, uh, working together, they manage to find common positions on different areas, including trade. Um, and I would like to mention the case of trade agreements. Uh, usually the common positions are very much supportive of concluding trade agreements. Um, and therefore for us, Denmark illustrates perfectly what we have been already trying to discuss for some time now, that um, policies are interconnected, uh, as Andre was saying, and that if we want to better showcase the benefits of trade and globalization, then we really need to work on our education, taxation, um, employment, health and industrial policies um, in order to uh, make a better distribution of the, of the benefits and uh, a more equal distribution, if you like, in the society. And I understand perfectly well that this is a very difficult debate and sometimes we enter into um, sensitive areas uh, such as how do we change our economic model. But I think this discussion merits uh, uh, some, some time um, for us to be able to, to adapt. Um, and this leads me to, um, to the fact that there is, of course, currently a backlash against trade. Um, we also see a very uh, a rising um, and warring wave of, of protectionism because, I don't know, is it because we have lived for so many years in, uh, uh, in a status quo that promotes open trade and we stopped realizing what the benefits of those policies are? Um, and of course, it is more worrisome for us in Europe that we see this protectionism coming from one of our main trading partners uh, in particular. Um, and so far, a very traditional supporter of the multilateral trading system. It's not the case anymore. So there is a fundamental change there and there is a major disruption, uncertainty for the future. So how do we address it? Um, <coughs> I would say that there is a very highly volatile and politicized environment in trade right now. Um, we used to believe, for instance, that trade rules under the WTO are stable, are there for everybody to follow. This is not the case any longer. Um, the fundamental principles of our trading world uh, are questioned. And the context of the WTO is very, very clear to us. The system is shaking, as one would say, but it's not able to react quickly. So how do we change that? For us as Business Europe, the question is whether there is anything positive coming out of this, of this crisis and how we as European business representatives can better work and uh, uh, try to contribute to <coughs> these uh, viable solutions. Um, it is a wake-up call, and I think that Mrs. Hassani has also alluded to that. There is an additional reason to make trade work for all. Um, because it's clear, protectionism does not work. Um, it only aggravates the negative effects that we already face. Um, closing markets means less exports, less imports, less investment, therefore less jobs, less growth, and less innovation. It is very, very clear. Um, so what do we need? We need a good and effective trading system that is able to address all those challenges that we face today and, of course, be also relevant for the future. 
Um, and it is in this framework that I would, like, I would like to give you one particular example of the work that we are currently doing in Business Europe. And this concerns the WTO. So traditionally, the positions of Business Europe focus on recommendations that have to do with the negotiating agenda of the WTO. What type of issues uh, shall WTO members discuss? Is it uh, uh, agriculture, non-agriculture market access? Is it e-commerce? Is it um, competition? Is it other issues on the agenda? This time, not only we focus on that, but we add other elements, including the structure of the WTO and how the monitoring system and the dispute settlement system works. And this is a first ever for Business Europe, and I'm very happy that I'm part of this exercise. And it is currently going on. We have not reached a final position yet, but I would be very, very happy uh, that uh, Business Europe is able to contribute in this debate. Um, and I would like to conclude by, by saying that our role is to ensure that the EU goes ahead with a very ambitious trade agenda at all different levels. Um, and we very much agree with the European Commission, this is a golden opportunity for Europe to uh, cooperate with partners, like-minded partners, and set international rules and standards, fight uh, protectionism and trade works, because they clearly do not work. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let me make one or two comments and then uh, open the floor for discussion. And we should definitely uh, end uh, by 2:15 or at the at the very at the very very latest. Um, so I think th th there's been uh, I think there's been two conversations. It seems to me uh, today. Uh, one is um, the trade and labor link and adjustment and labor market and another one is this global environment uh, where Europe finds itself uh, with China and the US. Okay. Both view this as threats to the, the system and Europe you know upholding the system. Um, so let me maybe Make one or two points, and all, you know, raise questions about the uh, the, the the two. Uh, on the first one, so I already alluded to that. I mean, I see very much, for instance, when you look at the Eurobarometer. Uh, so there have been some questions about globalization, about the sentiment of European citizens, so citizens in all of the EU countries, about uh, globalization. And typically, the question is. Uh, do you view globalization as a threat or as an opportunity? And when you look at the 28 member states, Denmark, I wouldn't say is an outlier, but is out there number one. Number one on the proportion who feel that it's an opportunity, very large, and rather small thinking that it's a threat. But it's true that when you look at the EU 28 countries, there's a whole range. There are some countries where it's the other way around, um, where there is a majority who feel that it's a threat, and it's a minority who feel uh, that it is a, uh, an opportunity. And, okay, if you're trying to correlate this, uh, um, you, uh, uh, Eva, you, you sort of made an attempt a bit to correlate I mean, with your last chart uh, with income distribution. And um, yes, there are some elements. There are some elements there. Probably it would be one of the factors. Uh, but I think what works a little bit better in terms of correlation, not in terms of causation necessarily, but in simply in terms of correlation, is some, again, indicator of how well labor market works, both in sort of flexibility and the security element, because both matters, obviously. I think it works better. For instance, in, in, your, in your chart, uh, the UK, and it's, I mean, it's obviously a correct, uh, the UK has a rather low performance in income distribution compared to some of the other EU countries. You had at the top there, you had Denmark and Sweden, Netherlands, Belgium, my own country, you know, good performance in income distribution. Then you have some countries which much less good like the UK, the UK was at the bottom. Uh, 
the UK is not at all on those Eurobarometer, it's more on the uh, opportunity rather than threat, okay, despite the fact that. Um, but if you look in the UK, you have low unemployment and you have sort of labor markets that work uh, rather well. People don't stay unemployed very, very long and their opportunities. And so I think it's, uh, but I think this diversity that I was mentioning before uh, is indeed, it seems to me, uh, a, an important issue. And I've always been very admirative in the sense of, you know, EU trade policy managing to keep 28 countries where it's not just that there are preferences, but there are, I think, objective differences in the working of the societies and therefore having different preferences. And yet we have one trade policy and it's, it's always very hard for the EU to negotiate with this diversity of countries. Now, now comes indeed the external element. And uh, I, I agree with what uh, Maria Arsenius was, was saying, that uh, you, we are all becoming, as you said, Danish since, since, uh, since Trump. Not because we have all adopted the same labor market and social policies, is because compared to that, and we feel that as a threat, uh, we, we, uh, you know, we, we are more unified in a sense. And um, so I think that that is that is another uh, conversation here is, you know, what is what is the role of uh, what is the role? What is the capacity of Europe um, to um, to indeed uphold the system? Right. I mean, since, as was said, you know, Carl, the uh, you know, from the Chinese side, we like the song that the Chinese are singing. Right? They have been saying something very similar to what we are as far as sort of the, the multilateral system, right? So we, we, we like that. Very, we, we, we're sort of like-minded with that when the U.S. is taking unilateral measures or threatening, you know, and China, like us, are saying, uh, you know, we want to do those things in a multilateral manner. Uh, on the other hand, yes, we do share with the U.S., as we heard, some of the um, worries about the, the way China is conducting its uh, affairs and the role of the state, and you know, we know all the firms, uh, indeed the Chamber of Commerce, you know, how they are unhappy in China and other places and things, and you know, all of those elements. So we have some, um, some sympathy with the US on some dimensions, some sympathy with, uh, with China on others. And uh, you know, are we able to uh, to uphold the system with allies, in a sense, with other like-minded countries? And I think this is this is going to be a, a very, very big, uh, very, very big question. And you know, and all the, those two questions, sort of all internal differences, which are, are real, because partly of those social system, and then or trying to upgrade, in a sense, our role into the uh, into the global system. I think it's um, it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, development. So let me let me take two or three questions again, and then come back to the uh, to the panel, and they will take whatever they uh, they they want. Carl, um, so a microphone here. I have a very Danish specific question which just, which reflects my lack of knowledge of Danish trade policy. But about 40 years ago, 40 plus years ago, when the United Kingdom applied for, for membership of the EEC, Denmark followed. And the argument, as I remember it, was that we must keep our exports of bacon to Britain. Uh, and uh, so, uh, there was a very close trade relationship. And Brexit has, and the UK has not been mentioned today oh, at all. Has this dependence upon the UK, has that disappeared? Good question. Another question? From the panelists? No other question? So, leave it to you. Maybe we go in reverse order. And uh, you take whatever you, you want from the, the discussion. Yeah. Um, I also see indeed two different debates, but they're closely connected. Um, and I think this is an important uh, uh, issue that we have to look at and pass the message to the politicians that, yes, there is one 
trade uh, policy at the level of the EU, but unless the benefits of those uh, of this trade policy is able to be translated more equally at the level of the member states through policies that are not necessarily 100% European competence, then we are going to still hunt how are we going to make trade work for, for all. Um, and that's why I said in the beginning that the, the Danish case and how uh, uh, the, the social system uh, and other supportive structures work in the country can provide a very good example to the rest of, uh, of Europe uh, in this regard. Um, of course, Brexit is, is a big challenge, uh, and we, it was not perhaps the, the focus of this debate today, but this by no means uh, uh, says that we are not looking into it. Uh, um, but um, I think that it is at the level of Denmark, and I think the minister uh, said it very clearly. Uh, Brexit was uh, was a decision that uh, Denmark would not uh, would not make. Jasper, well, Brexit is of huge concern. <laughs> <laughs> um, after after Brexit, we are faced with the uh, with the. Uh, Let's call it a challenge in terms of if the British or the, the UK government wants to be able to compete, raise their competitiveness, maybe they will lower their standards on the labor market. This is a huge concern between Danish trade unions. We have a large agricultural industry and fishing industry, very much depending on, on our ability to export. But we really must make sure that they live up to the same standards uh, as uh, the rest of Europe does. This was also my argument in terms of, of creating a level playing field internationally that we must at minimum uh, make sure that, that, that other countries we trade with live up to the ILO conventions, the core ILO conventions. Um, because otherwise it's gonna lead to, we're gonna see an increase of skepticism. We're gonna see protectionist measures from, from, from political leaders around the world. So this is a, first of all a political responsibility to make sure that trade benefits all but also a, a commitment from all the states to actually ratify uh, labor market conventions, ILO conventions. Um, and we need to make sure that uh, after Brexit, this will also be the case, uh, from a Danish perspective at least. Yes, yes, okay. Well, well, yes, everybody's talking about Brexit and, and, uh, and we are concerned. I think uh, if you if you looked uh, into the figures, you would see that we have become less dependent on trade with the UK, um, and we also see growth taking place outside the EU. So, so we're very much focused on some of the new free trade agreements with uh, with Japan and uh, implementing the one with South Korea with Canada. So, so there are a lot of good things going going on at the same time. And and while there were a few voices raised after Brexit that we should follow. Uh, I don't think anybody took that seriously. Uh, so, uh, so in that sense, Brexit supported our, um, you know, enthusiasm for for the EU project uh, and and brought us closer uh, to the EU rather than uh, away. So, so um, um, I think one 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 thing worth mentioning is that so the Danish case is a good case, but it's not the only. You know, way to to accommodate the the challenges of, of globalization. So so before we all turn into Danes, I think it's it's just important to to mention that there are many other instruments that you can use. And you mentioned you know innovation policy, education policy, and your infrastructure policy. So there's a lot of of different instruments that you can use bef before you start you know building a, a social system like like the Danish. Um, so so so. In, in basically, it boils down to having a, an attractive business environment as well. So, so you want to be able to attract foreign firms, you want to enable your own firms to grow and become or, or maintain their competitiveness. And, and, and of course, you want to make reallocation among uh, least competitive and competitive sectors as, as smooth as possible, but, but you don't need a, a whole Danish system to do that. Um, um, and maybe just a, a quick comment on China. So I, th I, th I think it's a, it's a huge concern. It's something we'll discuss for many years. But I think it's also, so 
we shouldn't be naive about it, but, but it's, this is also a process of catching up. So you have a huge economy that's been close to trade, close to foreign firms. And so there is a, there is a transition to a new normal, I think, uh, where, where there will be a lot of uh, uh, policy dialogues need, needing to, to take place. But we need to also understand their system. They need to understand our system. And I think it's also about you know bridging uh, that understanding. Um, and maybe one last uh, point is just a debate that's going on in, in Denmark. So while we've been discussing free trade a lot, uh, there's, uh, there's this uh, tendency to not call it free trade anymore, but regulated trade. And I think that's also important, important in terms of the, the whole dialogue about trade. That So free trade doesn't mean that you can just you know, send or sell anything you want in, in, the, in, in Denmark or in, in the EU, but it's actually like really um, uh, um, about product standards and, 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 and the regulatory harmonization. So it's, it's regulated trade rather than free trade. And I think talking about uh, the whole regulatory part of, of the, the EU and, and about free trade agreements also is important, I think. Very good. I think this is, uh, I mean, this is a whole topic in itself. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good way to, to conclude this panel, but it opens the door to an entire uh, discussion, obviously, and a discussion that we have had in, in this place on, uh, on several uh, occasions. And that is not going to, uh, to go away. So let me just uh, thank uh, all three of you. Uh, I think it was interesting to look at the Danish case. And I think, as you said, Eva, you know, the Danish case is a specific case, but uh, there are interesting lessons. And uh, you know, each country, I think, has to take that lesson based on its own history and circumstances. But it is certainly a, a very worthwhile uh, case to, uh, to study, to understand. And uh, I thank you uh, all three for uh, you know, bringing your, your knowledge to this discussion. Thank you.